Hey everybody, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Anatomy and Physiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Do you know when the coronavirus shut down, these videos on YouTube are intended for use by students in my class, um, enrolled in my Human Anatomy and Physiology classes at Del Mar College. If anyone else finds these videos helpful and learns from them, by all means utilize them. Um, the depth, the breadth, and the detail that is covered by your instructor may vary. I tend to spend a little more time on white blood cells and immunology than some instructors, less than others. So, you know, we all do things a little bit differently. Make sure that you test according to your instructor. Um, and I'm trying to provide a broad understanding, so I'm simplifying some things. Those of you that are very um, knowledgeable and kind of geeks like I am about this stuff, know that this video is intended for a specific audience. I may not have covered everything in the level of detail that you think it's necessary. Oh well. We're on page 38 of my notes set. I'm gonna do these definitions and then we're gonna to try to finish up blood. Hopefully we can do it in one or two videos, okay? So the definitions on page 38 are gonna help us understand the some of the lectures that we've talked about on the immune system. So I'm gonna get started. The first definition on page 38 is an antigen. An antigen is any substance that generates an immune response. And some books say an antibody response, which is an immune response, okay? So essentially this, another way we talk about them is we say that they are cell surface markers. They are proteins embedded in the membranes of our cells, integral membrane proteins that mark the cells. So let's say I take one of my cells in my body. It's gonna have hormone receptors and it's gonna have ion channels and it's gonna have these other proteins that I'll de designate with some letters. Now, all the cells in my immune system recognize those proteins. So they're not gonna attack the cell. My white blood cells would leave them alone. Unless you have an autoimmune disorder and then your white blood cells actually attack your own cells and kill them, <coughs> like systemic lupus and other things. Now, let's say I take my cell out of my body and I do some kind of organ transplant. When I put this cell in someone else's body, their white blood cells may not recognize that protein that person's DNA may not code for that specific protein because genetically we're all somewhat unique. So this person's white blood cell will go and attack that, and if it's a lymphocyte, it will make antibodies against that protein, and then the other white blood cells will attack it. So just because it doesn't generate an immune response in my cells doesn't mean it's not gonna generate an immune response in someone else's body or in another organism. So that's what we call an antigen. They are cell surface markers that can generate an immune response if that cell enters another foreign organism or a different organism, okay? Now, antigens are also called agglutinogens. Agglutinogens can generate agglutination or clumping together. So you might see this term, agglutin. To agglutinate means to clump. So we call these agglutinogens generators of agglutination. They can cause clumping or uh, antibody response. Now, another protein we can talk about is an antibody. Antibodies are called agglutinins. I don't like to use those terms, but you'll see them. And some people like the snobby scientific terms because it makes them so much smarter. But I like antigen and antibodies. Antigens generate an antibody response. Antibodies are proteins secreted usually by lymphocytes that bind to specific foreign antigens. We talked a great deal about antibodies in the last video. So when my white blood cells, my lymphocytes encounter a new cell, they can make an antibody against that specific antigen on the surface of that cell. All right, so those are the first two definitions. Uh, chemotaxis, diapedesis. I forgot what order I wrote these because I rewrote my note set this past semester. 
and for about 15 years I used the exact same note set and now I've changed it and some of the words are in a different order. So chemo, you know that comes from the word chemical and taxis comes from the word taxi which means to move. So chemotaxis is the movement of a cell along a chemical gradient. Let me explain what this means. We do this also as humans. If you walk into your home and you have a funky smell that you smell as soon as you hit the door, you want to find the source of the smell. So as you smell, you follow your nose, you go down one hallway and you think, okay, it got, it got less strong, it got more faint. Let me back up to where I smell it again. Let me go into this room. No, I don't smell it in there. Let me go into this room. And if you find the smell getting stronger and stronger and stronger, you can find the source of the smell. That's called chemotaxis. Well, white blood cells do that. When you have a break in your skin and you have some bacteria or viruses or some infectious agent here, Bacteria, as they steal the nutrients from our cells, the compounds they secrete very often, their waste can be toxic. And white blood cells will recognize that toxin and the bacteria and attack them. So what happens is, here's my normal blood vessel, and these cells, either neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes will either directly attack it, and they'll also start to release other chemicals like histamine and heparin and prostaglandins. Those chemicals can cause this blood vessel to dilate and become larger in size. What that will mean is more blood flow into this area, bringing more white blood cells. And how do the white blood cells know to go there? Because they follow these chemicals to the source of secretion. So we call that chemotaxis. This is how our white blood cells find the wound and know exactly which cells to attack because of the chemicals that those cells release or the chemicals that are released by other white blood cells. The movement along that concentration gradient is called chemotaxis. Diapedesis is, I'm not gonna write it out, but diapedesis is this. It is the movement of a white blood cell out of the bloodstream into the peripheral tissues. The movement of a white blood cell out of the bloodstream into the peripheral tissues. It's called diapedesis. Essentially what happens is as the blood vessel dilates, the, white, the cells making up the capillaries get strained and the white blood cells can literally squeeze through little gaps and then pop out into the peripheral tissues. The movement out of the bloodstream into the peripheral tissue is called diapedesis. So our white blood cells use chemotaxis and diapedesis to move out into the periphery to attack the foreign agent. Once they eliminate it, they can decrease in number. Now the next definition is called leuco, I think it's, I don't know, I forget which order I wrote them, so let me cheat and look. Leukopenia, okay? So leuco can be spelled with a K or C, and I do it both ways. Leukopenia, anytime you hear penia, it means a decrease, like osteopenia is a decrease in bone density. It's a loss. So leukopenia is a decrease white blood cell count. We know how many white blood cells of each you should have in your body normally. If your white blood cell numbers are low, that means you are susceptible to infections. You have what's called a compromised immune system. Your immune system is not as strong as it needs to be. And therefore, it's easier for you to get infections because you don't have enough cells to fight off the infection. This is one of the reasons that um, certain people are more susceptible to things like the flu and coronavirus and other viruses and other things that kill because they have a compromised immune system. Their white blood cell count is low. Now, the exact opposite of that is called leukocytosis. Leukocytosis is an increased white blood cell count. There's a number of reasons you could have a high white blood cell count, which, by the way, would raise your hematocrit. And that high white blood cell count can be, ca can be caused by um, uh, an allergic response, an infection of some sort, means you might have an infection, or you could have a, dis a disease of the blood called 
leukemia. The emia comes from heme, so this is an increased white blood cell count due to cancer in the marrow or of certain white blood cells. And as you know, cancer is just a cell that divides uncontrollably and can't stop itself, so it increases and increases in number. So leukocytosis does not mean leukemia. Leukemia is leukocytosis due to a cancer. Some leukemias are lethal, some are very treatable. There's different types of cancers, there are different types of leukemia. You'll learn all about that at some point. But leukocytosis simply means you have a white blood cell count that is too high. It could be due to seasonal allergies or some allergic response. It could be due to an infection. It could be due to leukemia. You gotta find out the reason. So leukopenia is a decreased white blood cell count. By the way, just for your information, HIV stands for human immunodeficiency virus. You have a deficient immune system. The virus actually invades white blood cells and kills them. So your white blood cell, particularly T cells, can drop very significantly, meaning you can't fight other infections. HIV per, per, uh, uh, directly does not kill people. Um, it compromises your immune system so that other infections that people would normally fight off now invade your body and take hold and take over and can kill you. So people with HIV are particularly susceptible to things like the flu, pneumonia, coronavirus. Someone who has HIV should really avoid the public and do the social distancing and the masking thing and all of that good stuff. Anyway, um, it leads to a thing called AIDS, Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. We're not going to talk about that. All right, so now we know those definitions. <clears throat> I think the next definition is erythropoiesis or hemopoiesis. Let me look them up. No, nonspecific and specific immunity. We've already covered these. Nonspecific immunity, also called innate immunity, is the immunity you're born with, done by monocytes, uh, eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils. Specific or acquired immunity is immunity that you acquire after exposure to an antigen, and it is done by lymphocytes. We've covered all that information all the way up to page 41. Um, we're going to move on. Page 42, by the way, my note said is not on your test, but it talks about what's called the MHC molecules or major histocompatibility complex, um, CD4, CD4+, CD8. Very complex topic. I cover some basics in here for my students that move into nursing. Keep your notes set and review all of this. It's going to help you. I can't tell you how many students that are in the nursing program come back to me and say, man, I use your notes set all the time, Mr. Long. I refer back to the notes. It's helpful. Anyway. Now, the last of the three major formed elements. So all of this time I've been talking, we've talked about two of the three formed elements. We've done red blood cells with hemoglobin and all of that. We've done all the white blood cells, which we could still be talking about for weeks, but we're not gonna do that. Now we're gonna talk about platelets rather quickly. So when it comes to platelets, in our bone marrow, hugging the wall of the bone, it's usually in spongy bone, there's these massive cells, very large cells, and these cells have a massive nucleus. If the average cell in the body were this big, then that cell would be that big. <coughs> Excuse me. Because they're so large with such a large nucleus, these cells are called megakaryocytes. Site means cell. Karyo comes from karyon, which means kernel or seed, which really means nucleus now. Mega meaning large. Megakaryocytes in bone marrow produce tons of these little proteins and little areas of the cell, and then the cell will pinch off a piece of membrane. It will literally start to extend its membrane out and pinch it together. If I enlarge this area right here, and those proteins get trapped in a little bubble of membrane, and then they completely pinch it off by exocytosis, and so they're releasing all these little bubbles of membrane called platelets. Those platelets are filled with all of these proteins that play major roles in clotting or coagulation. Okay, So 
That's what you need to know about platelets. They are not cells, they are cell fragments, little pieces of cells, bubbles of membrane pinched off of cells called megakaryocytes and are bone marrow. And their function in blood clotting or coagulation, as you're gonna see. All right, so now we have covered all the definitions we needed to cover. We skipped over a few pages to talk about platelets. There's a lot to blood. I wish we had time to cover everything. Now we're gonna cover a little bit more about platelets. It asks you to write out the steps of erythro and leukopoiesis. We've already done that. Hemopoiesis is the formation of blood. Erythropoiesis is the formation of red blood cells. Leukopoiesis is the formation of white blood cells. We've covered that. So on the bottom of page 43, we're gonna talk about hemostasis, okay? So now, hemostasis is the process of blood clotting. And it's rather complex, and I'm gonna simplify it. Again, this chemistry is all worked out. It's very, very complex. I'm gonna to cut to the chase on it. There's some major steps to hemostasis. You should know the steps and you should know them in order, okay? The first step in hemostasis is called vascular spasm. A spasm is a cramp. Now, if I were to look at, a white, uh, at a, an artery in, or a vein, but particularly arteries, if I look at it in cross section, the wall of the artery has a thick layer of smooth muscle. Veins also have that smooth muscle, but it's less thick. It's called the tunica media. We may have talked about it in lab. Well, anytime you cut a muscle, the muscle will contract. It will spasm. So if you break a blood vessel, let's say this is the diameter of a blood vessel, and I cut that vessel here, eventually what's gonna happen is the muscle in that vessel is gonna spasm, and it's gonna decrease the diameter of the blood vessel where the cut is. That's all that vascular spasm is, okay? It's a decrease in the circumference or the, the diameter of a blood vessel as the smooth muscle, the tunica media, constricts or contracts the blood vessel. That decreases the amount of blood leaking out. Now the broken blood vessel and the damaged tissue can start to release some other chemicals and that's gonna cause the platelets that are in the blood to get sticky. The proteins on the surface of the platelets will cause them to clump together. And so all those little platelets that we just talked about will start to clump together. And as they clump together, they get stuck in the blood vessel and they cannot make it past the site. And what that does is it decreases the amount of fluid they can go through. Imagine this. You have a sink in your house, and if you look at the drain in the bottom of your sink, it's crisscross like this. And stuff can go through there, small stuff, but if you start to drop other things in there, it will clog the drain. Now imagine this. You have that little cup-shaped thing like this that has holes in it that you can set in the drain. When I set that in here, now the holes are smaller. So if I run the same amount of water in here, the water will start to back up. Well, that's what's happening in the platelet phase. So during the platelet phase, platelets get sticky and start to block up the broken vessel. First it spasms, and then platelets clog together. The third step is called the coagulation phase. Now this is an important step, but in coagulation, essentially what's gonna happen is the, um, there's a protein that's released in our blood. And in the coagulation phase, what's gonna happen is we convert a protein called fibrinogen. And that marker's running out of color, so let me get rid of it and get a darker one. Into fibrin. So here's what you need to know. This is the generator of fibrin. fibrin. Fibrinogen is a protein released into our blood by our liver. It is inactive, and it's going everywhere in the body. Everywhere that you have a drop of blood in your body, there's some fibrinogen. A certain enzyme can start to kick off a chemical reaction that's gonna convert fibrinogen into fibrin, and the little fibrin proteins will start to stick to each other. And as they stick to each other, they'll start to make little chains like this of fibrin in all different directions. And they'll all clump together, and they make like a little net. 
almost like if you took a coffee filter or like a cheesecloth and you looked at it. So now, if I have vasoconstriction and I have the platelets clogging up my drain, I'm backing up fluid. Imagine if I went in there with this and then I dumped a whole bunch of corn and peas and smaller things in there that's going to clog up these structures and now the fluid will really back up. So in coagulation, we convert fibrinogen to fibrin and the fibrin will create these little nets and clump up with platelets and red blood cells and white blood cells and really just kind of stop up and massively decrease the amount of leaking. The fourth step is called clot retraction. In clot retraction, essentially what happens is this. All of those platelets have proteins in them. Those proteins are similar to actin and myosin, and when those proteins contract, it will pull on the platelet and squeeze it down smaller. If all the platelets do that, and they're attached to the fibrin, and they're attached to the walls of the blood vessel, it will squeeze the diameter of the vessel down even harder. So now it's gonna constrict the vessel even more, which almost completely shuts off blood loss. These are the four major steps of coagulation. Vascular spasm, the smooth muscle in the tunica media will, will constrict the blood vessel, slowing blood loss. The platelet phase, platelets become rather sticky, the proteins on their surface get activated and they start to clump together and block the vessel even further. In coagulation, we convert a protein in our plasma from the liver called fibrinogen into fibrin, and that will block all the spaces in between the platelets, so to speak, and then we get clot retraction. The platelets have proteins that pull the vessel in tighter and really just squeeze everything off and stop blood flow. Now what happens is, if the vessel can be repaired, then connective tissue cells called fibroblasts will move in and start to rebuild the blood, blood vessel and repair the wall. Once the wall is repaired, I can now come in here and dissolve the clot and open up blood flow through. And that's the fifth step. If we heal the vessel, we get into what's called fibrinolysis. Lysis meaning the digestion of fibrin. And there's a number of chemicals in our blood, but one is called plasmin. Plasmin and some other chemicals, heparin, um, can prevent clots from forming or can help dissolve clots. So, by the way, <coughs> on the next page, we go through the steps. On page 44, we're going to go through the steps of um, the coagulation phase. So now, if I take this phase and I look at all of this, there's a bunch of steps that happen here. Okay. So let me get to this, and we'll try to finish up this section of the notes. I'm going to go over some stuff at the very end, and then I'm going to do one last video on blood clotting. It's a lot of stuff on blood, and there's a lot of stuff on heart. This third lab test has a lot of information, third lecture test. Okay, so when it comes to um, coagulation, in the coagulation phase, there's a number of steps. So there's a, a protein in blood called factor 10. It's the Roman numeral 10, which is an X, okay? It's not factor X, it's factor 10. And it comes from the liver. As a matter of fact, most of these clotting factors are going to come from your liver. Your liver has a lot of functions. One of the major functions is producing all the, the proteins in your blood. Albumins, fibrinogens, and a lot of clotting factors. Now, factor 10 is in your blood right now, not doing anything. There's another enzyme that can be released. This is called thromboplastin. It is an enzyme. When you damage tissues, the tissues can release thromboplastin, called um, tissue thromboplastin. If it's released from a damaged blood vessel, it's called platelet thromboplastin. Platelets can release it when the blood vessel gets damaged. Either way, Tissue or platelet thromboplastin, it's really the same enzyme, converts factor 10 into a stuff called prothrombinase. Okay? So when thromboplastin is released, 
If it's released from the tissues outside the bloodstream, it's called the extrinsic pathway. Extrinsic meaning outside. The intrinsic pathway for coagulation is when platelet thromboplastin is released. And they really kind of both happen. Nonetheless, thromboplastin, once it's released, will take something that's already in your blood and activate it. This is an inactive enzyme. Okay. Factor 10 is an inactive enzyme released by your liver. It's like carrying a hand grenade with the pin in it. It's not going to do anything. Thromboplastin essentially pulls the pin on that grenade and activates it. Thrombinase is an enzyme. By the way, anytime you see ASE at the end of the word, it means it's an enzyme. It's a shorthand in biochemistry. Prothrombinase is an enzyme that takes another inactive compound. This is an inactive enzyme from the liver. So both of these are in your blood. When factor 10 gets converted into prothrombinase, now prothrombinase is going to take prothrombin and convert it into a stuff called thrombin. Thrombin is an active enzyme. Now thrombin is going to take a stuff called fibrinogen. Oops. Fibrinogen is inactive, it's in your blood, it's from the liver, and it gets converted by thrombin into fibrin. Now there's more steps, it's a little, little, it's a lot more involved than this, but to simplify the, the coagulation phase, damaged tissue, the extrinsic pathway can release tissue thromboplastin, the intrinsic pathway from inside the bloodstream is platelet thromboplastin. Either way, as soon as thromboplastin is released, it will convert factor 10 from your liver, it's in your, it's in your plasma, it will convert it into prothrombinase, an active enzyme. Now prothrombinase will convert prothrombin into thrombin, and then thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin. The reason we have this series of enzyme reactions is amplification, kind of like a denylate cyclase in olfaction. One of these can convert a thousand of these into about a thousand of these. So now I've got a signal that's a thousand times stronger. One of these can give me a thousand of these. And one of these gives me a thousand of these. So every step amplifies the, the reaction to give me a thousand stronger reactions. So a thousand times a thousand is a million. A thousand times a million is a billion. So from one molecule of thromboplastin, I can get a billion molecules of fibrin converted in a fraction of a second. The reason that's important is this. If I look at the human body, I took a little person standing here. Not the best looking person, they're kind of a mutant. Uh, they grew up next to a nuclear plant. But nonetheless, they drank the water in Detroit. Um, <laughs> if this person cuts their toe, because of all the blood vessels coursing all over the body from the heart everywhere, I don't want this chemical reaction to take so long that by the time it clots, it clots here. I want the clotting to occur at the site of injury at the damaged vessel. So I need a rapid amplification to get a rapid response at the site of injury and not create a clot downstream. I hope that makes sense to you. So you need to know the steps of um, blood clotting and you need to know the sub-steps of coagulation. Thromboplastin converts factor 10 to prothrombinase. Prothrombinase converts prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, okay? So, um, if you look at the bottom of this page, there are some definitions here. I want to explain these, and then I'm going to stop the video, and we'll do blood clotting. Okay? So let me erase, and we'll go into the definitions at the bottom of this last page here. <clears throat> so the first definition is a thrombus. And I want to explain this. I don't just want, to, I want you to memorize words. I want you to understand what it means. A thrombus is a stationary clot or a stationary blood clot. It's stuck to the wall of a vessel. So if I have a blood vessel somewhere and for some reason there's some damage to the wall of the blood vessel or some irregularity, we'll get a clotting reaction on the wall of that vessel and we create a thrombus. 
It's a blood clot stuck to the wall of a vessel. Now, that can lead to, the reason it's dangerous is it can lead to an embolus. And sometimes you'll hear people talk about an embolism. Well, an embolus is a free-floating clot, so it's an embolism. So sometimes a thrombus can break loose and start floating in your bloodstream. Well, if it's in a really large vessel, that's not a big deal. Like if it was in your a deep venous thrombosis, you, you'll hear about these things. If you see certain conversionals, they talk about DVTs, which stands for deep venous thrombosis. You got a thrombus in a deep vein. The reason they're dangerous is if you mess with that vein, if you start squeezing it or messing with it and you break that thrombus loose, it becomes an embolus or embolism. Now, <clears throat> imagine you have a vein in your thigh, like the femoral vein or the popliteal vein. As the blood vessel breaks off and it goes up your leg, the veins get larger till they get to the inferior vena cava. But as the inferior vena cava goes back to the heart, the vessels, the veins, and the arteries in the heart are going to be much smaller in diameter. So essentially, I'm going to do this. As the vein goes, as the thrombus becomes an embolus, if it goes through a larger vein, there's no danger. But when it comes to smaller blood vessels, what if it gets lodged at the beginning of this artery and stops all blood flow through that artery? That may happen to be one of the coronary arteries. Now I've stopped the blood flow to part of my heart. My heart's not going to get oxygen and glucose. It will spasm, have a heart attack, and eventually you could die. If you get a thrombus or an embolism in the lung called a pulmonary embolism, you can block off oxygen flow and carbon dioxide exchange in the lung. You stop blood flow to one lung. You massively decrease oxygenation of tissues. If you get an embolism in one of the... Um, uh, cerebral blood vessels, you can have a stroke. So a thrombus is a stationary blood clot. It's danger because if it breaks loose, it becomes an embolus, which eventually will flow into smaller blood vessels and block them off. Could cause major damage in the body. Now, <clears throat> I know we're probably getting kind of long on this video. Let me see how much time we've got. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to tie this up, but let me explain something to you. When you sit stationary for a long time, our veins, as they're fighting gravity, to stop the blood from flowing back down, if the blood pressure is low, I don't want to have backward flow of blood. So veins have these little things called venous valves. And the valves can fall back and catch on a little structure. And if any blood tries to flow back, this valve will fall here and catch and allow the blood not to regurgitate or go backwards. It just gets stuck in a little chamber. If you're familiar with ships that have these chambers, if you hit something and this starts to fill up, you close this part off and the whole ship doesn't sink. So these valves trap fluid in a specific area. Now, <clears throat> if you sit too long and you're not moving the blood, the blood will clot. Now, when you start to actually exercise, your skeletal muscles let's say in your calf or in your thigh, will start to contract and squeeze. As they squeeze, there's only one way for the blood to go. It'll push this valve open, pushing blood downstream, which could break loose a DVT and become an embolism. So anytime you go anywhere where you're sitting for more than two hours, if you're on a car ride or a plane ride or somewhere, they say every couple of hours you should stop, walk around, get some movement, get some blood flow in your legs. If someone is in surgery, and they're lying flat for a really long surgery, they can get DVTs. When they start walking around, they can get an embolism. If it gets lodged in the heart, the lungs, or the brain, it can cause major damage. So in surgery, they put TED hose on, these type hose, and they even have a machine that will, um, will fill up with air and squeeze your muscles to keep blood flowing to prevent DVTs when you're in surgery. It's also why after surgery, if you're laying around in your hospital bed, they don't want you laying there. The very next day, they tell you, come on, let's get up and go for a walk. They want you moving around because they don't want DVTs to develop, resulting in embolisms. Embolisms used to kill a significant number of people after surgery. People would have surgery, and then a few days later, just drop dead. 
and doctors figured this out, and now they make you move, or they put CPM, continual passive motion machines and things to prevent them. The rest of the terms that are on this page, all of these errands, here's kind of a clue. If you have an errand or an errand, they are an anticoagulant. They stop the clotting process. If you look at the names, heparin, coumarin. Coumarin has a cousin made by a different company called Coumadin. There's warfarin. All of these errands, even including aspirin, People take an aspirin to prevent blood clots. They're anticoagulants. The way they work is they stop part of the, the um, enzyme reactions that converts fibrinogen to fibrin. They stop one of those enzymes, either prothrombinase or thrombin. They block those conversions. So all of those terms at the bottom of the page, heparin, coumadin, coumarin, warfarin, they're all anticoagulants. They stop the coagulation reaction. All right. One last video we got to do, and that's going to be blood clotting. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did. See you on the flip side.